In the 25 cartoon Justice League Doom, secret files are stolen from Batman. However, he claims he can locate these files through a built-in safeguard, and presumably this protection works in a way that the supervillains cannot fake the files position. Back when this cartoon came out, this was complete fiction. There was just no way to do this. But now I'm going to tell you how this exact effect might be achieved. So in my previous videos, I talked about quantum position verification with all its caveats. Here, I'm going to assume it exists, and it can give us practical security against an attacker with finite resources. Let's see how we could use this verification process to track data. The first question we must ask is whose position are we verifying? Previously we have seen that if question shares are transmitted to a so-called prover with the speed of light, then based on the round trip time, the position of the prover can be discerned. However, this method tells nothing about who or what this mysterious prover might be. All we can determine is that the message indeed came from, say, the Pentagon, and sometimes that is enough. But there is no guarantee that we talked to the same person as yesterday. But now I want to verify the location of a specific file, and I'm going to make it a quantum file so that its uniqueness is protected by the no cloning theorem. Otherwise, the entire universe could be filled with copies, and the file's location would lose all meaning. Note that tracking a diplomatic package or nuclear briefcase is not much different from verifying the position, we just have to verify its position over and over while the file is on the move. In practice, the problem must be solved in more than one dimension, which means that there are more than two question shares. Let's say that a total number of V verifiers send their question shares to the prover, and that is enough to precisely determine the position. Also, let us assume that we introduce a bit of redundancy with an additional question share. This is still necessary to calculate the answer, but it isn't necessary to narrow down the position any further. We are going to use this additional question share as a tracker. Instead of getting the verifiers to transmit it during a round of position verification, we are going to hide it in the valuable data. But what we have to track is the valuable data, not the trackers, so here's the plan. First, we prepare n number of trackers, each with k number of random quantum bits. We organize the rest of the valuable data into memory slots, the same size as the trackers, and we encode this data into quantum bits, so that they are indistinguishable from the trackers. For example, we could use one time pad to hide any pattern that would give away the valuable data. Now, at this point, there is nothing stopping an attacker from separating the valuable data from the trackers. To prevent this, we need to perform some U0 unitary in secret that will mix the trackers into the valuable data so that an attacker cannot separate the two. After this preparation, we can put the data in a briefcase and let it leave our site. Whenever we want to know the position of our valuable data, we will get the verifiers to reveal a UI unitary operation that the prover can perform to produce the ith tracker. With this tracker and the rest of the question shares transmitted by the verifiers, the position can be verified. Each round of position verification consumes a different tracker. After i rounds of position verification, when we are satisfied that the data has safely reached its destination, we can reveal a vi unitary that separates the valuable data from the remaining trackers and decrypts the data. The only question remaining is what this U and V unitaries should be. Now that we have seen a high-level description of tracking, let's look at an example of how this might be realized. The first and simplest realization is through shuffling. So, we have our trackers and valuable data, and we create an unbiased permutation of memory slots as if they were a deck of cards that we shuffle. The unbiased part simply means that every permutation is equally likely, and an attacker cannot tell which memory slot contains a tracker and which one holds valuable data. This way, if the attacker removes a memory slot, she risks removing a tracker, which could be detected during position verification. This implementation, however, still has some problems. For example, we have no way of finding out if a valuable slot is missing. This can be solved by using a CNOT operation. So, if we have two memory slots, a control slot containing valuable data and a target tracker slot, we can perform a bitwise CNOT operation on the two. This produces something that is an encrypted version of the tracker. Performing the CNOT operation again, we can restore the tracker, but this means that the prover needs the valuable data as well as the encrypted tracker. But we must be careful not to give an attacker information about which slot contains a tracker and which contains valuable data. Therefore, we cannot simply pair every valuable slot with a tracker slot in a predictable way. So here is what we do. We have our tracker slots and valuable slots. We create a logical order in secret, 
which is an unbiased permutation. Then we perform the CNOT operations consecutively. We still have to hide which slot is needed to restore the contents of a given slot, so we shuffle again to create a physical order. Then we release this data to a carrier and allow it to leave our site. Whenever we want to verify its position, the verifiers must reveal the address of the tracker slot and the address of the control slot, which could be either a tracker or a valuable data. It can be shown that this reveal does not give useful information to the attacker. Now there is one trick here which is related to the trackers consumed during previous runs of position verification. What if the verifiers randomly select the jth slot as a tracker, but one or more previous slots in logical order are missing? This can legitimately happen if they were consumed by previous rounds of position verification. However, only trackers are consumed and verifiers know the contents of trackers. This means they can produce an extra slot E, which they can transmit along with the rest of the question shares and memory addresses of control and target slots. With the help of this extra slot, the prover can restore the tracker. There are other possibilities as well, but here I will only mention two. First is the possibility of super addressing. When we shuffle, we write the contents of a memory slot to one and only one address. This is a very classical approach. However, in a quantum RAM, addresses can be used in superposition. This means that we can write a single quantum bit string to multiple addresses in superposition. Consequently, a single memory slot can contain both trackers and valuable data. This might also help confirm the integrity of the data, since if we write to all memory slots in superposition, all memory slots are needed to read out the data. The second possibility that I'd like to mention is using the trackers as cryptographic keys. We might want to use the remaining unused trackers once the data arrives, and this may lead us to treat the trackers as cryptographic keys. This approach may allow us to track keys in a network during QKD. Similarly to how we could detect where a nuclear briefcase stopped answering, we could verify if a key reached a certain node in a network. If a link is cut by an adversary during a denial of service attack, we could identify where this happened based on the last verified node the key has reached. This would serve as an interesting counter to the fragility of quantum communication. And that's all I could talk about here. If you'd like to see more, make sure to check out our papers. Thank you for watching and see you next time.